When the federal government makes a life-changing decision, the last resort for many people is the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, or the AAT. The AAT is supposed to independently review government decisions, but there's a problem. The last 10 years of coalition power has completely corrupted the AAT as an institution and destroyed its independence. They've appointed a huge number of Liberal Party mates as highly paid decision makers, some who are completely unqualified for the job. Now that's a big claim, so in this series I'm going to do a deep dive into the AAT and what the current government needs to do to turn things around. Imagine the federal government makes a decision about you that you don't agree with. It could be something to do with disability or income support, workers' compensation, or a whole bunch of other areas. There's a chance that decision will have a massive impact to your life, especially if you're already vulnerable. Luckily, you have a few options to challenge that decision. First, you can try an internal review. This is where the department that made the decision in the first place reviews the matter again. Chances are they're not going to change their mind too often, and this doesn't give much protection against abuse of government power. To get a proper review, you'll want to have what's called an independent merits review, where someone independent looks at the facts and makes sure the right decision was made. The AAT is part of this system. If that decision is still not right, the final step would be to get a judicial review. In other words, you can take the Australian government to court. But this is time consuming and expensive, and not feasible for most people. The focus of this series is the AAT, which sits here, and which for many is their last resort. The AAT was established in the 1970s because there just wasn't a proper way to have government decisions reviewed independently without matters ending up in court. One of its biggest roles has been to protect people from unfair and arbitrary use of public power. The AAT is like an informal court. It doesn't require people to have lawyers and is designed to be easy to access and understand. It also covers a lot of areas. The tribunal reviews decisions that have a direct impact on the lives of individuals. These include the provision of income support to pensioners and veterans, supports included in the NDIS plan, a tax assessment, or the opportunity to have a partner or a family member visit or reside in Australia. And while the AAT is more informal than a court, it still has a lot of power. Instead of a judge, the decision maker is called either a member or senior member. And what they do is look at all the facts and the applicable law and check if the government's decision was the correct and preferable one. If the decision wasn't right, then the AAT has the power to change it. In the last decade, we've seen that the government does not like a strong and independent AAT. Why would they? They don't want an independent tribunal overturning shady government decisions. We have a problem with the AAT and there's no sense pretending otherwise. Uh, the AAT does not reflect, in many of these cases, the view of the Australian people. Uh, in my judgment, it's unacceptable to uh, be appointing people uh, who clearly don't have the confidence of the government mm. and clearly don't have the confidence of the Australian people. But for us, a strong and independent AAT is a good thing. And this episode will focus on one of the biggest threats to that independence, political appointments. When you think of an independent decision maker, you're probably thinking of someone who is qualified for the role, who's gone through a selection process, and who doesn't have clear political connections with the government whose decision they're going to be reviewing. Well, none of those things are actually true. See, because it's put to me that 65 of the current 333 AAT members are former Liberal Party staffers, former Liberals or National Party politicians, party donors, were members or unsuccessful Liberal candidates. Now is a good time to introduce Kim Carr, who as a senator investigated these issues for many years. He also led the Senate inquiry into the AAT that I'll be referring to in this series. I'm focusing on the Liberal Party specifically for reasons that will become clear. But whenever this is brought up, they have the same argument that they use. And for all the frothing about um, politicisation of past appointments by this government, it's also true to say that previous Labor appointees were often people who had connections to the Labor Party. Um, it's a little bit pot calling the kettle black, a little bit convenient um, for 
there to be a disproportionate focus on the right. coalition's one, appointments to the AAT. One day you'll have a job on the AAT as well. Time. So will Senator Henderson, so will Senator Chandler. Point, point of order. It's a matter is, of time. I'm point of order. order. It's not relevant. It's true that both the Liberal and Labor parties have appointed their mates to various positions in the past. It's interesting how the coalition uses this as some sort of justification for their actions, saying, well, Labor did it, so it's fine. But more interesting is that the data tells a completely different story. The Australia Institute recently released the results of a massive study into the extent of political bias when it comes to appointments to the AAT. By appointments, I'm talking about the hiring of the decision makers similar to the hiring of a judge. The study looked at almost a thousand appointments from the beginning of the Howard government in 1996 until the end of the Morrison government in 2022. They analyzed each appointment to see if there was any political connections, like whether they were former members of parliament, staffers of politicians, or failed political candidates. The data is fascinating. The numbers are broken down into three year chunks and they show the proportion of appointments that had a political connection. During the John Howard years, between 4 and 11% of appointments were politically linked. Remember, the higher these numbers, the more political bias the process had. Ideally, you want the number to be close to zero. During Kevin Rudd's first term, the proportion was 8%. When Julia Gillard took over, and when Rudd returned, the proportion had dropped to zero, which is ideal. But then the new wave of coalition governments came into power, and things changed drastically. When Tony Abbott's government won the election, the proportion of political appointments jumped to 23%. That means almost one in every four people they hired as members of the AAT had a political connection. But it gets worse. Around Malcolm Turnbull's time in government, the proportion jumped to 35%, more than one in every three appointments. But the award for the most blatant politicisation of a supposedly independent organisation goes to Scott Morrison, who took that proportion up to 40% of appointments. This is corruption. You might be thinking, does it really matter that Liberal Party mates are appointed to the AAT in such high proportions? The answer is yes. Remember, the point of the AAT is to make decisions based on the facts and the law, independently from government. If all of a sudden decision makers are being replaced with people strongly connected to the government, that independence is lost. These new decision makers are probably more likely to agree with the government's position. The second issue is that the government has been using these highly paid and important roles as a reward for their mates. To make room for all these cronies, the government terminated the roles of experts, as this anonymous insider submitted to the Senate inquiry. I witnessed highly experienced and efficient members whose performance exceeded expectations in all areas, dumped and replaced by inexperienced, inefficient post-2014 members. By the way, it's a theme that people from within are scared to speak out for fear of having their careers ended. Removing good people also reinforces to those remaining that they better get in line with the government, or they themselves may not be reappointed to their roles. This happened to people like Terry Carney, who made decisions correctly identifying RoboDebt as unlawful when the scheme was just ramping up. The government ignored these decisions, fired him, and the disaster of RoboDebt continued for years more. I talk more about Terry Carney's situation in this episode of my RoboDebt series, and it's pretty disgraceful. Link is in the description. So when we talk about liberal mates getting these jobs, who exactly are we talking about? The website Crikey has been investigating this for years. They've got a great series of articles about the political stacking of the AAT, with lists of names, their connections and qualifications. Reading through that is unbelievable. It's no wonder Crikey itself has been directly attacked in Parliament on a number of occasions when these articles are brought up. Um, you might use as reference um, the Crikey article as of Monday the 22nd oh, of well, May. <laughs> Do you have any serious source, Senator? Well, the facts will speak yeah. for themselves. Sure. Oh, yeah. Numbers. The facts numbers, will... numbers are numbers. If The facts if, will speak for it, themselves, the numbers of... will be the numbers. Either Crikey exactly. is wrong or right. And if, you if need not of, denegrate the source. People, if a lot or of me. people's terms expired, so they did. Yeah, well, the, the facts will be the facts and you've taken that on notice. Thank you. 
If you're going to refer to media reports, um, uh, yes, please provide uh, we'll, those we'll, for we'll the witness. Find that out. Well, let me just, uh, given we've only got a few minutes, let's just say that the Crikey report was uh, Mr Carney had a long career at the AAT and together he worked Particularly with... given it's a Crikey report. <laughs> well, what you mean to say that that's, what, illegitimate? Is that the suggestion? I mean to suggest that it's very important we ensure reliability. This particular article from Crikey has a great list, and I'll share the link in case you want to read through it. Amongst the numerous ex-politicians, candidates and donors, there are a bunch of staffers for some senior Liberals, like a former advisor to Tony Abbott, a former chief of staff to Scott Morrison, a former staffer of Joe Hockey, and former advisors of Michaelia Cash, Christian Porter and Malcolm Turnbull. The list keeps on going. Now to be clear, I don't know any of these people personally. They could be great tribunal members, but that's not the point. As law academics from the University of New South Wales pointed out in their submission to the Senate inquiry, whether or not appointees with political affiliations end up being competent tribunal members capable of making independent decisions does not alter the public perception of their partiality. And that's even assuming these politically connected people try and pretend to be independent. Sometimes even that isn't the case. This is Karen Sinan, a former Liberal Party senator who was recently promoted to become a deputy president of the AAT on a salary of about half a million dollars a year. Back when she was in parliament, she was saying things like, the values which underpin Australia's culture are being attacked by the welfare mentality. She said, these people look desperately to government to solve their problems, to hold their hands and to pay their bills. Now this video isn't about social security. The reason I'm including this is because someone with decades of Liberal Party linkage and with strong political views on social security, doesn't really give off the vibe of independence. So I was surprised to learn that a few years ago, Christian Porter appointed her as the AAT's head of the Social Services and Child Support Division. But there's more to this story. During the 2019 federal election, evidence emerged that Karen Sinan had been openly supporting Josh Frydenberg's re-election campaign. The AAT had this to say, Ms. Sinan's campaign activity during the last federal election, um, she was campaigning for the Treasurer. Um, there's various photographic uh, evidence to that effect. Given, uh, Minister, what, what's the current policy position uh, in terms of independent reviewers of government decisions at the AAT and campaigning? The political campaigning. What's the current... Um... Well, again, the AAT is responsible for its own operations and management, mm-hmm. um, and this is consistent with its independence from government. Um, and as such, questions relating to the conduct of AAT members as put by no, you sir. are a matter for the tribunal. And so I'd therefore ask the registrar, can you tell me what is the current policy about members of the tribunal uh, engaged in campaigning well, there, there is a member code of conduct, uh, behavioural code, which would outline that it is important that members understand they need to um, remain impartial. And so I think being actively involved in a campaign is a matter that the president would believe comes in conflict with that. Are you that aware code. of what I've said to be, has that been drawn to your attention before? Uh, all I'm aware of is a social media post, which um, does not necessarily indicate that it was active campaigning. My understanding is when, as soon as we became aware of that, there was a discussion with, was then part-time member signing, and that was removed and effectively that that was addressed at that time, which was some time ago. I see. So you you think it's been removed some time ago. Is that the evidence? My understanding is as soon as we became aware of it, that it was, uh, she was counselled by her then uh, division head. Mm -hmm and acknowledged that it was inappropriate and removed that post. Okay. Apparently she was spoken to and the issue was resolved. Except here we are during the 2022 federal election and again it was being reported that she had Josh Frydenberg billboards on her property. What kind of message does that send about the independence of the AAT? More importantly, how are all these political appointments even possible? Surely there's a selection process based on merits at the AAT. In their submission to the Senate inquiry, the AAT itself said that appointments are ultimately a decision for the government. That should warn you about what's to come. There's not much detail about the selection process from when Labor was last in government, other than this snippet I found from Senate estimates. 
Mm -hmm. Mr um, Secretary, can I clarify this? Is it any different to the process that was in place under Labor? Um, I'd have to ask Mr Anderson before my time. Or was it in the department? Uh, Ian Anderson, Deputy Secretary, Legal Services and Families Group, Attorney General's Department. Uh, the, the process under Labor did involve uh, uh, um, an advertised process with, yes, with a, a selection panel. But the briefing note that was actually produced under FOI from the department actually did specify that there was a different approach taken from the department from that from the previous Labor government. Now, the department said that prior to the government introducing its own appointments protocol, and I quote, appointments to the AAT were made in accordance with the Australian Public Service Commission's merit and transparency guidelines for merit-based selection of APS agency heads and statutory office holders. George Brandis, the Attorney General under Tony Abbott and Malcolm Turnbull, changed all that. He developed a one-page document called the 2015 Protocol, which is what he followed for AAT appointments. The protocol says that the AAT will tell the Attorney General how many positions they need filled. The Attorney General will then indicate which positions will not require a public call for expressions of interest, because he might already have people in mind. If there are any positions left over, it is only then that a register is established for expressions of interest from the public. A selection committee then reviews the applications and provides recommendations to the Attorney General for the remaining roles. Interestingly, there's no requirement to even interview people for these jobs paying hundreds of thousands of dollars. And even then, the Attorney General can ignore these recommendations. Point 5 says the Attorney General is not limited to candidates preferred by the committee and may choose a candidate that has not been suggested or is not on the register. In other words, the whole selection committee looking at public applicants is a sham. The Attorney General has the power to override all those steps. And the public doesn't get to know how many appointments are made using a selection committee and how many the Attorney General just chooses himself. The next question, not about advertising, is whether or not in relation to any appointment to the AAT by this Attorney General, has there been a selection committee process established? There's only been that one batch of appointments, okay. Senator, in, in May. Right, so the answer is no. That's correct, Senator. Thank you. Um, uh, and uh, uh, was the department asked to advise on whether the 76, or, and in particular the 37 new appointments, were appropriately qualified? Was the department asked to advise, Senator? Yes. Uh, no, we weren't. Senator. So you, you provided no advice as to uh, whether or not uh, um, any of the 37 new appointments were appropriately qualified? Uh, we, we gave no advice on the individual appointment centre. Okay. Uh, where did the names come from? Did the department generate a list of names? No, we didn't, Senator. No list of names was generated by the department? That's correct, Senator. So the list was generated in the Attorney General's office? I'd have to take that on notice, Senator. Well, do you know where the list was generated? Uh, no, I don't, Senator. Right. I, I can only say that it didn't come from the department, Senator. The list didn't come from the department, thank you. The written answers provided to all these questions was the same non-response. Appointments to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal are made in accordance with the protocol. There's effectively no transparency in this process. No wonder this is what the data shows. A day after that questioning in the Senate, Malcolm Turnbull, then the Prime Minister, was asked whether he thought the process was acceptable. Just days before caretaker, the Attorney General announced 37 new appointments to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. During Senate estimates last night, it was revealed that none of these positions were advertised. There was no merit-based selection process or departmental advice. None of the candidates for these positions were recommended by the department, and there was no consideration of any conflicts of interest arising from their political affiliation. Given that 37, these 37 jobs have a salary of up to $370,000 each year, does the Prime Minister consider this process acceptable? The Prime Minister. Member for Hunter. Cautioned a number of times. The member for Lindsay will not interject. The Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, the appointment of uh, Australians to uh, offices of this kind is, of, of course, a very important responsibility of government. Uh, the uh, the the government takes its that responsibility very seriously. The Attorney General 
is a, an office holder of uh, considerable discernment, and I have no doubt that all the persons appointed uh, were excellently qualified for the position that they have been uh, selected for. I guess it's all good then. In 2018, Christian Porter, then the Attorney General, commissioned a statutory review into the AAT, run by a former High Court judge. This review criticised the way in which appointments were being made and said that appointments needed to be selected as a result of a transparent process. This report, as well as all the heat Crikey was bringing with its reporting, resulted in the new government under Scott Morrison developing an updated process, the 2019 Protocol. The current makeup of the AAT mm. is a lagging indicator of past policies. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you're aware of the fact that uh, Prime Minister Morrison uh, wrote to the President of the AAT uh, seeking his approval for a revised protocol, uh, which started late last month, so it's very new, okay. it's just, just in place. And uh, under that protocol, the, the whole selection process in terms of candidates for the AAT is now a merit-based process. Uh, which has not been the case in the past. So you're, you're correct, the current makeup is what it is, mm. uh, but we have put in place a merit-based process um, as recently as the 25th of March. Uh, so the future makeup, we trust, will reflect the merit to those who are involved um, and available and put themselves forward. In fact, it will be advertised and people put themselves forward for selection. It's interesting that they're openly admitting that the old process was not a merit-based process. There's one issue, though. This whole thing was marketing spin, which of course it was. And that's because this new 2019 protocol is pretty much the same thing that was there before. There are all these wonderful steps about seeking expressions of interest, maintaining registers, and the AAT recommending to the Attorney General the suitable candidates. And all that is great, except, like before, the document clearly states that the Attorney General is not limited to candidates recommended by the AAT and may choose a candidate that has not been suggested or is not on the register. And that's exactly what seems to happen in practice. In their submission to the Senate inquiry, the Melbourne Law School said that not all members appointed had lodged an expression of interest and that the precise process concerning the nomination and appointments remains a mystery. And I totally agree because it's still up to the Attorney General, and none of the other process steps really matter. The government claimed that this was a merit-based process, but when asked simple questions, like how many people the Attorney General had chosen, instead of choosing from people that went through a selection process, there was never an answer. And of those reappointments um, or appointments, how many were made as part of an expression of interest of being a member in response to the president seeking an expression of interest as outlined in the protocols. So, Senator, are you asking how many put in an EOI and then were ultimately yeah. appointed? Yeah. Senator, but to I'm sort of unable to answer that, Senator, in the sense that it would disclose Cabinet's consideration of potential appointments or reappointments to the AT, because after the president gives their views to the attorney, the attorney puts them through the government process, which involves Cabinet's consideration. Sure, of them. sure. All I want to know is how many persons were appointed that had actually gone through this process or, as been outlined in the, uh, under the protocol, the process outside of this through the other than through the President. Um, Senator Carr, I think um, Mr Manning has answered your question. Well, I've asked the question, how many persons were appointed that weren't actually recommended by the President? As Mr Manning's indicated, Senator, we're, we're getting into the, the realms of what's a Cabinet in confidence process, which mm. is the, the making of appointments to the AAT. Well, why can't you tell me how many were not recommended by the President? We're outside of that process. Yet. So the recommendation by the President feeds directly into uh, who the Attorney then proposes to, to Cabinet. So uh, I'm, I'm loath to go to uh, any part of that process in terms of that would help uh, identify or point to the potential for uh, there to be uh, a decision by the attorney on an individual as to um, who was appointed or who, who was not recommended for appointment. In other words, the coalition was hiding behind Cabinet secrecy 
to block any transparency of how appointments to the AAT were made. Cabinet secrecy is a bunch of rubbish, and if you want to know more about it, there's a series I made where Scott Morrison's application of it was successfully challenged by former Senator Rex Patrick. Having the AAT compromised by political appointments has serious consequences. The New South Wales Bar Association, in their submission to the Senate inquiry, summed it up well. They said that poorer quality decision making results in the needless expenditure of public money, and more importantly, it results in injustice. Political appointments also bring with them a reduced level of public confidence in the AAT. Appointing people who aren't the best suited for the role means less ability to apply the facts and law correctly. And that means decisions will be vastly different from member to member. One organisation that deals with the AAT constantly, Economic Justice Australia, wrote in their submission to the Senate inquiry that their lawyers were able to identify individual members who consistently fail to exercise all available discretions in their decision making and who are likely to make errors in their application of the law and policy. The Senate inquiry report summed this all up, saying that the chances of success at the tribunal largely depends on the decision maker assigned to the matter rather than on the merits of the case. The data shows this to be true. A study by researchers at Macquarie University compared AAT members in refugee decisions and found that on one end of the spectrum, there were members that had not found in favour of a single asylum seeker applicant, while on the other end of the spectrum, there were members that found in favour of asylum seekers over 80% of the time. This is not a surprise. The former Speaker of the West Australian Parliament, Michael Sutherland, has received a full-time AAT appointment for, for a five-year term. He called for re refugee activists and environmentalists, uh, and we called them a bunch of cockroaches during an unsuccessful bid to be elected to the Senate in 2007, yet uh, he will now go on to hear or is hearing matters related to both environmental matters, matters and refugee applications. The point here is that the AAT is meant to be an independent body with competent people appointed based on merit. Otherwise, the entire institution is corrupted. And when that happens, people don't want to stay and leave the organisation. Do you know uh, uh, Bernadette Ryan? Bernadette was formerly a senior executive of the tribunal. Mm -hmm. She resigned from both the tribunal and the public service, uh, probably would have been April um, last year. Do you know why she resigned? Uh, the, she made a decision that was the right thing for her to do. I can't say any more than that. You don't, have any other, uh, any, you don't have any other that. explanation other than that? Uh, no, Bernadette decided that she that it was time for her to retire. Mm -hmm. She put out a tweet um, to say that the Ministry of Appeals Tribunal is a repository of LNP failures, staffers and mates. I think this is the tweet they're referring to. But she's not the only insider publicly recognising the problem. Jennifer Strathen, who was a long-standing member of the tribunal, wrote a submission to the Senate inquiry, saying, Some of these AAT appointees have obvious conflicts of interest, have not performed to the required standards, have caused backlogs due to incompetence or lack of motivation, and have been paid high remuneration for achieving little of use to the AAT. Her term was meant to expire in late 2024, but she was fed up with political appointments and quit. This is what she said on the 7am podcast. I'd still be there if I could be, have confidence that it would be an organisation um, based on accountability, integrity and the rule of law. And the ones who are um, appointed um, as political appointments, and have been, um, I don't feel confident that they would actually observe the rule of law to the required degree. The solution here should be simple. Make the selection process merit-based and independent. The relevant recommendation in the Senate inquiry report covers this quite well. The process needs to make clear the selection criteria, the roles need to be advertised, an independent panel needs to go through the applicants and recommend the best ones, and the Attorney General shouldn't be able to override them. I want to pause for a second and show you something. When the Senate inquiry into the AAT released its report, which was over 100 pages long, 
the coalition didn't agree with any of the findings. So what they did was produce their own section of the report, called the Dissenting Report from Coalition Senators, and it is one page long. It's written by these two Liberal Party Senators, Sarah Henderson and Paul Scar. Their first point is that they strongly reject all recommendations made in the report. They say that the current protocol for appointing people onto the AAT should remain, you know, the one where the Attorney General bypasses any form of merit and transparency. They present no evidence as to why the report's findings should be ignored, and there's no alternative or helpful suggestions. There is zero substance. Make of that response what you will. The good news is that the new government is reviewing the AAT. Labor's Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus, had this to say. We want to return to a a transparent and merit-based appointment system for those courts and for the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Part of that will be calling for expressions of interest and part of it will be having panels. They will sift through the expressions of interest. They will conduct interviews and make recommendations to me that I will be able to take forward to Cabinet for appointment. So uh, there you have uh, a a transparent system that people can understand that there is a system, again, not on a a whisper basis, not on uh, disgracefully, as we saw from the former government, where particularly for the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, they appointed some 90 former Liberal members, failed Liberal candidates, former Liberal staffers to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. That is no way to proceed. Do you intend to reverse any of the appointments to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal that have been made by the Coalition Government? I am going to be fully reviewing the operations of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal to make sure that it is fit for purpose, to make sure that it is working at the optimum level. It affects hundreds of thousands of Australians every year. They deserve to know that the very best people have been selected to sit on those merit-based review processes And uh, at the moment, you cannot have that confidence in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. This is positive. We don't have any specific details yet, so we'll just have to wait and see. The concern, though, highlighted in the Senate Inquiry report, was that even if the current government was to bring in a merit-based appointment process, you still have the problem of a heavily infiltrated AAT, stacked to the brim with Liberal Party mates. That's where the most serious recommendation from the Senate Inquiry becomes relevant. The committee recommends that the AAT be disassembled and then re-establish a new federal administrative review system which takes into account all the problems with the current model. In other words, scrap the whole thing and start again. This might seem extreme, but it might just be needed. If this episode hasn't concerned you enough, stay tuned because the next episode will. Thanks for watching. If you want to support the channel and help me make more content, please consider checking out my Patreon page. Link is in the description below.